So, uh, Daryl, uh, thank you so much for uh, being here in our humble but uh, very dear Look Fest. You know that this is something that we put together in order to have uh, to bring to at home music shows, music lessons, interviews with fellow speakers, uh, conversations with uh, around music. And I can't really think of many other artists that have a, a musical journey so rich and, and profound as you. So it is truly an honor and I'm sure everybody will enjoy this very much. Thank you once again for, for being here in the Loop Fest. Uh, I also like it that we, uh, sh sure. Uh, I, I feel also a bit lucky that I get to interview you while we have a new Stones song out there. So. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions about that. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, song, very fitting for the moment. But if that's okay with you, uh, I'd like to start more from the beginning. I wanted to ask you, uh, how was it that you got involved in music? And what was it that, uh, how did you choose a bass guitar? I'm a bass player myself. Uh, so it's maybe not a, a super common choice for kids uh, it's usually more guitar or piano or something like that so i wanted to to learn a little bit of how that happened for you yes i um well i kind of grew up in a musical household my both my mother and father mu mother and father are music lovers my father actually was the first to teach me uh how to read rhythm or how to read music basically because he played drums a little bit you know when he was in the service and uh, when he was young and always practiced with a little practice pad. So I started on that when I was about seven years old. Uh, it was after I saw a friend, a neighborhood friend, a guy who lived a couple of doors down, play in a in an elementary school talent show that I decided I want to learn how to play the guitar. I didn't really know the difference between the bass and the guitar at that time. I just saw him playing a guitar and decided to ask him to teach me to play. And so when I asked him, um, I said, well, can you teach him how to play the guitar? And he said, you want to learn how to play the lead guitar or the bass guitar? And I said, well, what do you play? And he <laughs> said, well, I play the bass. He said, I play the bass. And I said, well, I want to learn how to play the bass then. That's actually how I got to be a bass player. You know? um, for, for, I knew about name, acoustic. You're... Yeah, well, I, I knew about acoustic for... bass. For a nine-year-old, it must be like a big instrument to, to grab, right? Well, you know, it's funny because you've seen me on stage with the Stones playing a Mustang bass, a Fender Mustang. Yes. That, that, that wasn't my first, that wasn't my first instrument, but it was my first real instrument. We had, my uh -huh. mother bought me like a, a, a like a, a copy of a, of a, 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 a Beetle bass, like the hollow right. body. It wasn't yeah, a yeah. honer. It was a copy of a copy of her <laughs> on Earth. And it basically came apart in my hands one day. And then she went and bought, <laughs> went and bought, a, bought a Fender Mustang. So I grew up playing a small bass because I, I was a small kid. Yes, yeah, short scale. And, and, and actually, I think it's a great sounding instrument. As you know, I play one with, I play it on satisfaction. I play the same, yeah. literally almost, it's, it's not the same instrument, but it's the same from the same year, same color that I had when I was very young, young kid. I've got a few uh, Mustang basses now too, yeah. But that's how I got to be a bass player. I, and and Darry, was it always uh, jazz from the beginning? Then your father was a jazz musician. You see this guy playing. Was it just from like from when you were a little kid, or or you kind of evolved into that? Well, of course, my father was a, a, a big jazz fan, so I had been hearing jazz music my entire life and was aware of it. And of course, he encouraged me to get involved with learning to play jazz music. Uh, the guy who taught me, a guy named Angus Thomas, who is we're still great friends, um, he uh, taught me songs from many different genres. The first song was Thank You For Letting Me Be Myself uh, by Sly and the Family Stone. It wasn't the version that uh, Larry Graham played, but it was a simpler version. Um, but that, uh, Led Zeppelin, um, uh, the Staple Singers, uh, uh, a Cisco Kid by War, the band War. And so there was, I was really learning a lot of different kinds of music from the beginning. Of course, my mother loved Motown and, and, uh, 
and James Brown. So, you know, all of those became influences. And I was one of the really lucky musicians to learn kind of all of the different genres of music or many different genres of music kind of from the beginning. Because you went also to high school that had a big music yeah. program too, right? Right. So I learned, or I played orchestral music with the with the orchestra. I also played jazz music. We played pop music of the day. Uh, we played a lot of different kinds of music, and uh, and so yeah, my when I think about it now that you ask, my background in music has been much has been pretty varied from the beginning, all the way from jazz to pop. Very nice. And even with a little uh, a little bit of classical classical music as well, because I played acoustic bass uh, in the right. in the high school or, in the high school orchestra. Okay, and you were pretty young too when you actually got a very interesting gig in your life. Uh, you started playing with Mr. Miles Davis, and I was reading in your website. Uh, it's very well written and a very beautiful story. How was it that you actually got uh, that phone call? from his camp and how was it that that first audition so I, i would like you to share that with with people watching this interview well as i said i went to a really great you know high school i went away to college for a year outside of chicago and studied music played with a lot of different bands didn't do as much school work as i should have but i you know i got a, a really good uh, in high school and in that year of college i got a lot of really great music education I came back to Chicago after a year and started playing around the Chicago music scene. And one of the musicians that I played a lot with was Vincent Wilburn Jr. He's a drummer who was also Miles's nephew. And so um, uh, we used to, you know, obviously we talked about, you know, his connection to Miles. And at one point he went and recorded Man with the Horn with Miles. And of course, when he when he came back, We were all asking him, well, what was it like to play, you know, to, to, to record with Miles? And, and of course, you know, late night after gigs, he would pick me up and drop me off at home. And we would sit in the car and dream about playing with Miles. And he later, uh, you know, a few years later, he went and uh, he went on tour with Miles. I think it was in Japan. I'm pretty sure it was in Japan. And at the end of that tour, Miles decided to make a change to, uh, to, to the bass player. Um, and Vincent recommended me. Miles asked him, are there any guys in Chicago that I should hear? And Vince told him, yeah, you should hear, hear, hear Daryl. So they called me on the phone and Vince tells me over the phone, he says, Miles wants to hear you play over the phone. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, you know, at first I thought he was, at first I thought he was joking, but it ended up that he wasn't joking. Um, But I never did end up playing over the phone with Miles. I ended up flying to New York the next day, and I and I played much better. Him. And uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, it was great. I mean, and I got a chance to meet Miles Davis. It was great. So uh, yeah, that was uh, and I auditioned for him, and he hired me. So that was uh, you know very story. special. Yeah, really special, special. I feel really incredibly blessed to have had that experience so early, so early in, in, in my career. And it changed everything uh, because Miles is so well respected that it's all it's become a kind of credit card. I mean, a, or a calling card where when um, when people ask me, well, who have you played with? And you say, well, <laughs> I played with, play with Miles Davis. Generally, you at least get get a chance to get in the door and they, they want to hear you. You, you, you have to, you have played with so many of the greats that you actually can leave a few out of the conversation and, and it would still be it would still be impressive uh yeah but and yeah, it, yeah. It, it's it's it, it, it's insane because you did that then you played with sting and you played in some of the like really popular albums and and tours of sting you played with uh peter gabriel and in mm. 1993 uh you received probably the other great call that a musician can dream of uh, at any point in, in history. You, you got a call from the Rolling Stones uh, and you ended up uh, nice. being their bass player. So how did that happen uh, for you? Well, um, I had met, uh, I met Mick when we recorded, uh, when we were uh, doing the Sting movie. 
he came uh-huh. down to the Mogador Theater where that where that uh, movie was filmed or the, the the concert footage was filmed in in Paris. Uh, and I met Keith Richards through um, Charlie Drayton and Keith. Uh, 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 Charlie Drayton and Steve Jordan, yeah. who were in Keith's band. So I'd met both of, of them, and some kind of way, you know, I got, yes, when they was, were looking, oh, a- actually a friend of mine called me and told me, he said, uh, listen, man, I think I heard that Bill Wyman is leaving the Stones. And I thought, well, man, of course, we've been hearing those rumors for years. And he said, no, I think he's really <laughs> leaving this time. And he said, uh, should I try to find, you know, a phone number for Mick, you know, Mick, Big Jagger's management or something. And he called me back and said, here's a number. And uh, I called and, you know, said, I heard that you guys might be looking for a bass player. I'd love to get on the list of people who are going to audition if there is such a list. And, you know, the person took my name down. She said, it'll be a while, probably a few months. But they called. And I ended up going to New York in, I guess that would have been May of 1993 to audition with the Stones and play through, you know, a lot of the hits, uh, you know, Honky Tonk and Brown Sugar and, and uh, uh, you know, a bunch, bunch of the well-known songs. And a few months later, I went back to uh, and audition with them again after they had written the music for Voodoo Lounge, which was the, the first record that I played on. And it was then that they hired me to record that record. And, and during the recording of that record, they also asked me to uh, to come on and, and go on tour with them. So that's basically how that happened. And of course, you know, like I said, you know, I, I, w- I was told by people in their camp that uh, that uh, Keith asked, you know, who are we, who are we, who are we playing with today? And somebody said, well, you're playing with a guy named Daryl Jones. And he says, wait a minute, I know Daryl from Charles Charlie and, and Steve's friend. And he said, yeah. So, well, Keith said, well, who has he played with? And apparently some, somebody said, well, he played with Miles Davis. And Keith said, oh, OK, I, I guess we should have a listen then. Yeah, OK. You know, so, yeah, again, yeah, it's always been. That's really amazing. Great, yeah. You know. a, a calling card. And, and yeah, the, the connection that Keith has with uh, Steve Jordan and all the, the expensive winers, uh, it seems exactly. like a very tight one. So I'm sure that that. Uh, yeah. I think it was uh, Bernard Fowler who said uh, when he arrived, uh, I think a few years before you as a backup singer, uh, because he he clearly came from a mixed side that he had to gain uh, Keith uh, trust. He has a pretty Mm -hmm. impressive uh, resume himself. He does. He He really does. He he really does. Mega talented musician, but no Miles Davis there. So. I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's, you know, he's, he's played with, you know, incredible musicians as well, and and he's talented, and he's a lovely guy. So it was only a matter of time before before Keith really accepted him, you know. And they're great friends. Yeah. I I found it uh, very interesting that you played both with Miles and the Stones because I usually think of the Stones in many ways as a jazz band. They are, of course, mm-hmm. a rock and roll band. They are, of course, a blues band, but uh, the way I see them is, is they are also a jazz band, and that's something that becomes clear when you see uh, you guys live in certain songs, uh, but also in some recordings. Some, um, I, rem- uh, I think, Miss You, uh, which is usually described many times as a disco song, I think it's more like a jazz song. So I wanted to, to share that with you and see if you agree and if you also find some jazz in, in the way the Stones uh, write music and perform music. I wouldn't, I would, I would describe them much more as a blues band than as a jazz band. Uh, of course, there are some elements of, of all different kinds of music in all different kinds of music. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that what you say is, is, is inaccurate, but I see them more as a blues band. Uh, and uh, even I, even Keith, I think, when we recorded Blue and Lonesome, the blues record, uh, he, he said to me, you know, basically the songs on this, on this album were a set list for us before we started writing the pop stuff, you know? So I, I you right. know, I, I think that they really did come out of. They, they're they're most heavily influenced by, by by blues music. I think a bit more than jazz. Obviously, they're aware of you know of everything. There was a period where 
every time I hung out with Miles, uh, hung out with Keith, he was listening to Kind of Blue, you know, by Miles Davis. So they're all aware of all these different kinds of music. And uh, Charlie and Mick used to go and see Miles whenever he would play and go see all sorts of jazz artists. So they're aware of jazz music, but it's a blues band. I think in my estimation, it's a blues band. Very cool. Yeah. Charlie, big uh, Charlie Parker fan, too, right? Absolutely. Charlie, Charlie Watts is, a, is a, his, his probably his first love musically is jazz music, you know, uh, but he's cool. darn good uh, rock and roll drummer as well. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So, Daryl, one, one cool thing about uh, or one, one thing that comes with uh, joining the Rolling Stones is that you got to tour the whole world and several times. And really, the whole world, just not not just Europe and and the whole U.S. But uh, so I was wondering if you enjoyed life on the road, and if that uh, also made you appreciate like different cultures, different foods, different music. Of course, uh, if if you really like going out there and discovering new things. Absolutely, yes. I. I um... My traveling, well, of course, it began with miles. We traveled all over Europe, all over Japan. Um, I never went to South America with miles, but uh, of course, with Sting, we did also a world tour where we went everywhere. It's my first time being in uh, in South America, and uh, you did um, the the Amnesty tour, right? Oh, the Amnesty tour, yeah, that was with Peter Gabriel, where we went Peter to a lot Gabriel. of places that I'd never been. I'd never right. been before. I'd never been to Africa. Um, Uh, they were, yeah, that, that, that tour, probably, I was, think it was 13 different countries. And so I did a lot of traveling. But to answer your question about the different cultures, I really do feel blessed to have been exposed to both the music, the food, and the culture of all of these, all these different places. I love Japanese culture and Japanese food. I love, you know, you know all, of the South, all of the countries of South America. Is, there's some incredible music that I've been exposed to in Uruguay and Chile and, you know, and, uh, you know, and all over South America, as well as all over Europe. And, you know, I, I feel very blessed and I do definitely try to, to um, educate myself and expose myself to these different kinds of, you know, to the different music and cultures of the places that I've been. I think it's important. I think that it really helps musicians uh, become, you know, much more broader have a much much broader outlook, you know, studying and and uh, and uh, and delving into these different cultures. So I do think that's very important, and I'm, I feel blessed to have uh, to have been able to travel and learn as much as I have. And I've got friends all over the world, all over the planet, which is also how you really interface with the different cultures. You have to know somebody right. who will turn you on to to the different things. You know? Very cool. Uh, Daria, I also wanted to talk about, uh, well, you have your own line of instruments. I see a few mm -hmm. there. And yeah, they are cool exquisite bass, bass guitars, uh, exquisite guitars. And I wanted to ask you, what, what was it that brought you to, okay, designing your own instruments? What is it that you want to bring to the table? And if you mm -hmm. can share a little bit about that process and how you approach it. Well, I guess the the... It begins with being a kid and loving instruments and, you know, growing up and having one bass guitar. I always wanted to have more guitars. And so I, when I look at the fact that I'm building instruments now, it's connected to that. It's like, you mean now I can have any guitar <laughs> that I want? But the way that I began, began, got involved with designing instruments was really um, before the, the, the Daryl Jones uh, signature model that we did with Lakeland. That instrument was actually designed by myself and uh, a, a luthier named, uh, and bass player, really incredible bass player, named Albi Balgoshin. And we designed a, we were trying to design a production model instrument because he designed this very exotic fretless bass for me that I played with Miles for a while. But we decided to, because pre-CBS jazz, um, pre-CBS pre um, Fender instruments were starting to gain right. so much in price <laughs> that we wanted to, yes. to be able to have an instrument that felt like that, 
but that was a little bit more accessible to young, you know, young players and to, you know, players mm -hmm. that, you know, couldn't afford to, at the time, spend six or seven or eight or $10,000 for pre-CBS, P-Base or Jazz Base. So in a way, that's where my, where I started. I really, I love Fender instruments. I grew up playing Fender instruments. And so uh, the, the thing that I'm doing is I'm basically just trying to, use you know fender as a kind of model and just make a few small changes uh there are things that fender did early on that they've gotten away from but i like those things that they got that they got away from a little bit more um uh curved uh fingerboards and things like that um just a few small changes and a few you know modern production uh uh, uh techniques you know using a CNC machine, for instance, and, uh, and uh, you know, so that you can really dial in instruments that are consistent and, uh, and each one has, a, has the, the feel that you're looking for. So basically it's uh, how to build, you know, uh, or how to, to, to develop uh, an instrument that is basically kind of a modern pre-CBS instrument. Is, is really what I'm interested in. And of course, we're doing some things that are a little bit different. I'm, you know, the two instruments are five string instruments that you see in the background here. So we're doing, you know, a, you know, basically uh, a, a serious nod to Leo Fender and the people that developed those instruments and just a little bit forward thinking production practices and, and manufacturing pra practices is what we're really trying to do. Very cool. And also Very cool, build yeah. build instruments that build instruments that you know that are you know a little bit more time is taken building them you know something that when somebody touches they can feel that the instrument has been cared for and has been you know has been built by people who really care you know and so but basically that's what I'm, I'm trying to do we're at the beginning stages really at the very beginning stages of, of the company. Very cool. Yeah. I, I have to agree with you that pre-CBS era is something that we all dream of and, and it's getting a little bit impossible to, to get those instruments. So so it's it's great that you are doing that. Uh, yes. Daryl, well, I, 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 you guys have a new song out there. It's, uh, it's a fantastic song. It's the groove mix performance, the lyrics, so fitting with the moments. And that's a song that I guess uh, comes from those sessions of that elusive new album that you guys have been working on in the, in, in the last, I guess, uh, couple of years. And I wanted uh, to ask you a little bit about it, about that song in particular and about that mm -hmm. recording process uh anything that you can share i'm sure there are a lot of stones fans that will appreciate well um actually it's funny because we started like you say we started working on a new record it's been more than two years ago and uh, there's been a number of songs that we recorded and then last uh, february a year ago february uh, we record we were in los angeles and we recorded a bunch of new songs and I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, Ghost Town was was uh, one of those songs that were recorded back in February. And uh, until I heard it, I didn't really, I wasn't sure where, which, which session it came from because we've probably done three or four groups of sessions. So I wasn't sure where it came from, but I think it came from the recording that we did in February uh, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm pretty sure that's where we, at Jim Henson, at Henson Studios, right in, in Los Angeles. Um, cool. The recording process is, you know, basically the same. Um, we, they, they do like to, to learn the music a little bit um, and, and play through the songs a little bit more than when I first joined the band. There's a little bit of rehearsal to, to, to so that everybody can be comfortable enough to really come up with, you know, with cool parts and stuff. And so um, that's basically the model. We, you know, run through things a few times. Um, and maybe even sometimes some of the songs we, we've run through over some of these different sessions, changing them a little bit to see what, you know, works and to dial them in to, uh, you know, to what, what they're looking for. And so 
it's a pretty straightforward recording. Um, uh, but we just try things. We do, you know, a few takes and try a few different things, uh, sit around, talk, you know, we'll listen and, you know, Mick or Keith will say, well, let's try this. Or, you know, somebody will come up with an idea and we try that and just keep knocking at it until, until you come up with something that feels right. It's, uh, and you guys work with a producer who is actually a bass player. Is that something that yes. uh, it's interesting to you too? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Don's a, Don is a, you know, Don's a, a fine bass player in his own right and has done quite a lot right. of things. And he has, um, he's, he's, uh, it's been really great working with him because he gives me a lot of room to, you know, to do things. They all give me a lot of room to try things. They all, you know, a lot of times Mick will have suggestions about maybe the sound or, or, you know, taking the bass line in a different direction. And so we just try a lot of things, but, uh, It's great working with Don was. He's been we actually came on to the to the into the group to work on Voodoo Lounge. We both came on together at the same time. So Right. That uh, was his first uh, album too. Right. Exactly. So it's been it's been I really love working with him. He's a great uh great facilitator. You know, he really does um play a great role in helping to glue everything together. You know, he's he's a great great asset to the band, I think. Right. And he's uh, the head of Blue Note Records now, I, I, I think, right? Yeah, 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 which is really great because he's, you know, it's um, maybe maybe some of the problems with the music industry have been that it's no longer musicians who are making decisions about, you know, the direction of a company. And so in, in his case, it's great to have somebody who is a real music lover and not necessarily just an executive who was making decisions about the music there. So he's, uh, he's you know, I would say that he's also a valuable asset for uh, for Blue Note. Very, yeah, very interesting. And speaking of which, the other, let's say, piece of news that came in the last couple of weeks uh, from the Stones camp was that uh, beautiful uh, performance of You Can't Always Get What You Want on the TV special, right? Mm -hmm. Were you a part yes. of that? No, yes. no, I didn't. I, I didn't. I, no. Yeah, no. I was not a part of that. No, um, I think okay. they were just doing something. They wanted to be involved in the, uh, in the, uh, in in the you know in that event to you know throw support behind all of the people who are helping in such a dire you know under such a dire circumstances. So I think they put it together pretty quickly. No, they. I wasn't contacted about that. I wasn't a part of that. Yeah. Well, one thing that was interesting uh, about seeing, yeah, it was, you, you could hear it was like a, a small version of, of the band, but uh, pretty much everybody was there from all the current pop acts, super popular, mm -hmm, yes. Paul McCartney, who was amazing, of course. But I do think that the Stones made it very clear on another level. And I don't even know what, what it was. It, was it like just the coolness of seeing the four of them, enjoying the moment, playing the song so beautifully, mixed vocal performance. Uh, so it was, it was really beautiful to watch. And I wanted to ask you uh, if you knew, because there is a big uh, debate on the Internet, Uh, about hmm. Charlie, was he just air drumming to a pre-recorded uh, track, or he was actually triggering the sounds? Uh, you know, do you know? I'm not. I'm not really sure what what was going on there. I do know that I heard at some points. I did hear, you know, some other maybe there, but they were being assisted by some other tracks. I thought I heard a bass track in there somewhere, but in terms of what was actually going out. I thought that I heard Charlie playing on boxes. I don't know whether I, I heard a, a cymbal and I didn't see a cymbal. So I'm not sure exactly okay. what was going on with that. You know, I think it was probably pretty quickly put together. I don't think there was, you know, I don't think it was a lot of time to, to, to decide to do a lot of, you know, slick things. I think they put it together pretty quickly. And I think if people like it, I think that's part of the charm of it, that it was really, just kind of off the cuff, which rock and roll should be, you know, it shouldn't be too exactly. well thought out. 
you know, it should be a little bit loose. And so I think that's probably what, why, if, you know, if you, people, you say people really enjoyed it. I think that would be the reason why, because it was just loose. It wasn't so incredibly well rehearsed or well manicured, you know. Okay, Daryl, uh, you've been so generous with your time, with uh, your stories. I want to thank you again for, for being a part of the Loop Fest. I can't tell you how much uh, we admire you as a musician. Um, and again, we are really, really honored to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm sure people at home, Stones fans, uh, jazz fans, and everybody uh, got a, you know, uh, got a nice rest from what's happening outside by, by listening mm. to you. So thank you again uh, for doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafa. And I want to say, man, that I admire you as well, man, for what you're doing in your, in your uh, efforts to educate children and to give children a way of, of, uh, of learning guitar. I think it's very important, man, that, that children learn music. I think it's, it helps with all walks of life for children to be you know, involved in, in music. And I applaud you for what you're doing, man. Um, uh, I, I'm, in, I'm very honored to, uh, to be a part of, of the Lug family in, in any way that I can. And please contact me if there's anything more that I can do to help. Thank you very much. Means a lot. I will never forget this day. And see you hopefully in the road soon. I still have my Absolutely. Detroit tickets. I'm holding to okay. those. That tour should come uh, soon. And see you yeah. in the road. Absolutely, man. Take good care.